Hi, welcome to another episode of Voices Talk Show. Today we are actually discussing disability in our community and I want to go ahead and give my panelists a moment to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Keith Norling. I'm from the Alexander area and uh, I've been involved with the Alexander literacy and state and national level. I'm Gail Culp. I've been involved with disability since the late 70s and I consider myself a disability rights advocate. And I'm Deanne Rungi. I grew up in Alexandria and moved back after college. I work for a small company doing payroll and I also do videos and um, forum moderation for an organization that uh, focuses on rare diseases, which I have one. So. Okay. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you being part of this panel. It's um, a pretty big deal to me. This conversation um, is very new for me. I am coming from a personal perspective with my children. Both my children are on the spectrum. I have a six and three year old, a boy and a girl. And um, my son was diagnosed with autism in June of last year. Mm -hmm. And um, Though I knew probably by the time he was about two years old that something was different, um, his speech was, you know, delayed, and that was of course the first um, sign. But there were also behavioral issues that weren't quite what I expected. So I remember when I got the diagnosis, it was the furthest thing from my mind of what we were actually going to hear on the other end of that call. Um, and it took me a really long time to actually wrap my mind around that and understand um, what disability means. So what is your personal experiences with this? Well, mine um, started roughly uh, first grade. It was in country school. I was um, kind of beat up by a teacher and uh, if you couldn't she'd put the spelling words on the chalkboard and I couldn't spell it and so and she'd put drumsticks across the fingers and and uh, since then I've always uh, hated school or um, or scared of the world and uh, so then I um, if you're back then if you're naughty in school, you're naughty at home. So I never ever told my folks mm -hmm. what was going on. Right. So, but um, it went from there to, um, you know, it was just passing through grades and that. And then uh, I, uh, but when we went to town school, and that was seventh grade, mm -hmm. well, not realizing they put me in um, um, a special ed class okay. for low learning levels and, uh, and that's from seventh to twelfth grade all of a sudden I was labeled mm -hmm. and surviving and you know but um, but also back then it was a work ethic so you didn't worry much about school then yeah. so but it um, that's how mine started okay. but there was quite a career after that so oh, wow. okay, okay. Well, my story is easier on me in a way because it was my son who was born with severe uh, brain damage. And we knew there was a problem when the doctor said he may not live through the night. And so we realized we were not receiving that bouncing baby that we were so much looking forward to playing with. And we weren't even sure we'd have a baby to go home with us. So what happened was he got transferred to an intensive care nursery. We were living in Salt Lake City at the time. And he was there a total of three weeks at the hospital. And he was able to get out of the intensive care nursery for the last week before we brought him home. But we were told that we shouldn't expect anything out of him and that his life expectancy was very, very low maybe five or six years old. Um, 
And then after he made it to five, then it was, well, he might live into his teens. Well, Jason, uh, who lived on love, uh, passed away at the age of 35, and that's about six years ago. So he never did take a step. He never said a single word, but he lived with us, and we loved him, and we still love him, and we remember him, um, and thankfully, because we learned so much, our hearts got much bigger, and we got a lot more patient with life, <laughs> because we had to be patient. But that's an important lesson to learn. So, but me, I wanted to get in and make his life the best it could possibly be. Yeah. So that's where I got my roots. Yeah. <laughs> and um, well, along with what you were saying, my mom was told that I wouldn't live past three, pro probably. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I'm, I just turned 40. So I, Congratulations. I, I, I take it as an achievement. <laughs> yeah. um, but I've had an overall positive experience in this community. Um, there are issues that need improving, of course, but um, I found it uh, easier as a child, being more supported. Um, when I'm an adult, I've had to really advocate for things I need and yeah. uh, things that I need help with and that the community could help with. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, my experience has been really well. Um, just not too long ago, a young boy just opened the door for me going into the mall mm -hmm. without being provoked by his parents. Yeah. And I thought that was great because a lot of times kids, when they see a wheelchair, they're like, what's that? Yeah. Um, and I, instead of you know saying oh don't say anything or hush hush mm -hmm. you know this boy opened the door and you know welcomed me so i thought that was pretty neat oh that's sweet i think that it's important that even though we're um even if you don't have like a personal connection to disability or disabled yourself it's so important i think that we expose our kids to different types of disabilities and to teach them the etiquette around that and just expose them to things like that because I realize a lot of times it's mostly because people don't know what they're looking at or they're not sure what um, what to say and so they think that they're being helpful and you know and a, and a lot of times they can be so offensive um, I just recently had an experience with a family member who, um, in the last year since I've been learning more about my, my kids' autism and learning, you know, all the nuances that are involved in the spectrum itself, I, I'm trying to be very positive about things, so I'm, I'm putting hashtag autism strong and, you know, and I'm really proud of my kids' like accomplishments, so I celebrate everything. And I had um, just put up a post about my son who was having like a difficult first week of school. Um, he just started kindergarten, and so I wanted, you know, to just put something up just saying how great he had been and, and how he really trooped through everything thing and got through it and um, someone sent me a message back and it was a family member and they're like your son looks normal so why do you feel the need to like put this out there because it's going to cause him to be bullied or um, anything like that and and it hurts so much just to read the he looks normal part and then it just hit me like that's why, that's why I have to keep <laughs> hashtagging <laughs> as much as I can because I don't think people realize like how hard it is to, to hear those things. And, and, and I think they think because they're telling the parent it doesn't matter and the parent's not experiencing it, but it did matter and it did hurt. And, um, and that's something that I, I don't think I'll ever really forget because it, it made me realize that this is the 
a very normal attitude that people have and especially in my community black community we tend to hide it and 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 put it to the side or just pretend like it's not there and I don't want my kid to feel like his disability is a hindrance or it makes him an other and and that 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 was really eye-opening for me um what are the common misconceptions about disability well, I, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, on my part of it, I don't think um, I hid it because I couldn't read. So I, I just uh, I learned uh, ways to um, what they call streets of Arval, you know, in a way. Um, <clears throat> uh, like um, you, you learn to, your memory all of a sudden comes better, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and then because um, when you have oral classes, then you you remember and you try to write the best you can. I couldn't read or write very well. Mm -hmm. It was about a third grade level. But uh, yeah, I, I'd get passing or a sm uh, D or enough to get by through school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but when I turned um, 16 for my driver's license, I, uh, um, I memorized what I got wrong on the first written test. And, uh, and then the next, and I got lucky and the next test was the same. And so I just memorized what dot to dot, and I passed it. So by wow. rights, by rights, I shouldn't be driving because I couldn't read it. Oh, you know, wow. so. Wow. And, so sure. in, in yeah. your case, you, they assumed you were stupid or you couldn't learn because yeah. you had trouble with reading. Well, because I was in that class, and that put a. Especially after seventh grade. Yeah. 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 That's why you ended up there mm -hmm. because they assumed you couldn't learn. Mm -hmm when you needed to learn differently. Back then there was no really oh. special help. Okay, so Yeah, no that was back in the 70s, yeah. Okay. Um, I think maybe a common misconception is that it's, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it must be nice not having to walk and drive around in a wheelchair or you get you get privileges because mm -hmm. you're in a wheelchair at the good parking spot or um, things like that and it's it's really more out of necessity yeah. if I could walk around I surely would <laughs> um, but you know this is I'm okay where I'm at um, and then another misconception is kind of the opposite of that, that, oh, you must have a miserable life yeah. because you're disabled, or you must not be happy. Mm -hmm. And I lead a very good life. I have a loving, supportive family. And it's, you know, I'm okay being in a wheelchair and not being able, I can't reach my head, but, you know, I can do lots of other things. Mm -hmm. So kind of that's. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, one thing is that disability, not all, there is of course a spectrum even in disability in general, of course, um, and not all are visible. Um, and I think that especially for children and families, our parents going through those experiences it's, it's difficult because when you can't see what's happening, um, there, it's almost harder, like, because for me, I'm constantly advocating for services or advocating for my son in, in different, you know, social situations. Um, and even my daughter, and she's getting a little bit older and um, starting to pick up on some of the same things. And I realize part of that is because we're, we're in this place where we're, of course, we're learning, we're learning to, we're kind of like adjusting as we go with our parenting. And, but it's so hard to actually make people understand what the day-to-day -day struggles are and just that because just in that comment from that family member that they look normal, um, that makes it so that <clears throat> you're being, all the things, your struggles you're going through kind of feel like they're not being like it's not it's like it's invalid or um, because you're not you know doing something in a physical manner. So, what do you think we can do as a community to combat some of these 
issues that we're having? Because you said earlier that there are some areas of improvement um, that we can have. What are some of those examples? Um, well, I know as an adult, um, some of the services for dis disabilities are limited. Like you have to seek them out and know what's available. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's hard to do. That's always the case. Um, <laughs> and going to college, I learned a lot of what was available. So when I came back here, I could say, okay, I can live independently with this support. Mm -hmm. um, I know for my case, uh, I can't drive. And so I rely on either my mom who has an accessible van or the bus service in town. And they run Monday through Friday from eight to five. Um, and Great so, social life. <laughs> so if I wanted to go to a movie on a Friday night, I'd you have can't to call that. my mom. And so I can't do that. So services are kind of limited that way okay. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know uh, when I wanted to move on my own, housing options are very limited. Um, we ended up purchasing a home and remodeling it enough so I could have it be accessible. Mm -hmm. But as far as like apartment buildings, or it was very limited. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you know, if we could open up that area as well, it mm -hmm. would make it a lot easier to be an independent person. We are fortunate in Alexandria. We do have one uh, building that was designed to accommodate people with disabilities, and that is Nordic like Meadow okay. on 34th Avenue. And that was because of parents who mobilized the community yeah. to help get the granted funds to be able to build something like that. Well, there's 14 apartments. We know there's a lot more than 14 people with disabilities who could benefit from that type of housing. Yeah. Yeah. And the security and just accessibility built yeah. with disability in mind. So I think it's, that's a positive step, you know, and I congratulate the Alexandria HRA for being willing to step in and yeah. provide some of that seed money to make it possible to get the grant. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm waiting for the next one. <laughs> it, yeah, go ahead. Do you have like, are there support groups um, that people can actually go to, even if it's parents or, um, or people who are disabled themselves, like, is that? Well, the windmill project uh, still is functioning and we're starving because we don't have time to fundraise or the energy because we're all tired <laughs> uh, as parents. But we are still there and we are available to help connect parents to each other and to help them find those resources to, or to even know what they are to begin yeah. with. Um, I think one of the problems we've got, though, is that we're not getting the same kind of referral uh, to the project as we used to because of the funding, and they recognize uh, that because we're not funded, we can't do all the things that we would like to be able to do. Yeah. But by golly, we'll give it our best shot, and we do focus on that, connecting them to information and resources so that, like you, Joe said, yeah. you can go out and, and find them. Yeah. So. And I mean, the One Mill Project was the first uh, organization in town that I was invited to to right. be part of with my son. We actually did um, Christmas last year, um, and he got to meet Santa, and it was like, you know, sensory sensitive. And, and I thought that was really nice um, because a lot of people don't realize, you know, the the difficulty it can be to have a special needs child in a very like loud or boisterous environment where there's lots of flashing lights and stuff and so it was nice because all the volunteers were so sweet and just helping us like take our time because of course he needed to warm up a little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it probably took us a good 10 minutes to actually reach Santa Claus on the other end of the room but it was just because um, and everyone was so sensitive to that and and I don't get that everywhere, you know? I mean, obviously on a day-to-day -day basis, like if he throws a tantrum in a store or something like that, you know, I 
I'm just used to getting on the floor and having the tantrum and just dealing with it. Um, but it's hard. It's hard because our lives are dictated by doctor's appointments and therapy and uh, this para versus that para. And, and, and it's a constant like rotation of services. And while it's exhausting as the parent to go through it, I know I'm doing the absolute best thing I can for my kid. And I feel so blessed that that I have that community here because um, that's probably my greatest reason for still just wanting to be here is because of the community I've built around my family. And my kids are loved and their their teachers and therapists and paras are like family. It's an extended family. And I, I don't know if everybody has that, but I, I'm glad that it's, some, it's something that this community provides. Have they told you yet about awesome athletes? I have not yes, heard of that. It's starting up, so we'll have to get you some information. Okay. What do you think, Keith? Um, well, through uh, adult literacy, um, that's where I found I had a reading disability. Oh. And, uh, you know, and now I think they do find that out in schools, but back then when I was going to school, there was no such thing. And, um, and if you did have to get tested, it was very expensive. Mm -hmm. But since, uh, I always said when my wife turned me into adult literacy, <laughs> <laughs> we we're, were married and she sent me to town to buy some Miracle Whip. And, um, and when you can't read, you just go pictures and just mm -hmm. observe everything. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the jar and it had a blue label and I brought it <laughs> home and she said, this is Hellerman's. And <laughs> That's when the manure hit the ventilator. <laughs> and uh, I, she uh, said, you can't read, no. And uh, so. Wait, she hadn't known up until that point? Pretty much not, no, no. Oh. Yeah, within a year, yeah. Oh, wow. So, and then it just lucky it'd be that she heard an advertisement on uh, adult uh, basic ed and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Alexandria Project Literacy. And so she brought me in and had an interview, and, um, and that was the beginning. I had a, I've always said I went to high school twice, and I had a tutor yeah. for 12 years. So, wow. Yeah, and that turned my life around. So, oh. And yeah. you know what? You kept that a secret even throughout like high school. And oh, yeah. Actually, oh. I was pretty good in sports for wrestling, and I'd gotten a two year free ride in a co junior college, and mm -hmm. I turned it down because I couldn't oh. read. Oh. Yeah. So. My husband also had, had a reading issue and uh, dyslexia, and he, what he says is, they just said I was dumb and made fun of me, lot, made yeah. fun of me, yeah. and kind of told me I'd never amount to anything. Well, he's amounted to a lot. He's a wonderful man, a great father, terrific community member, and <laughs> to, but having to have that experience created some sensitivity in him that I think he shares with others. He's very welcoming and caring and kind because of what he experienced. Yeah. But he became the joker in the class. Oh, that sure. was how he dealt with it. Well, that's how you hide it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you hide, and you yeah. get to still be part of the group yeah. because you're yeah. a little troublemaker and mm -hmm. you can take all the brunt <laughs> <laughs> for the, everybody else. But I want to thank you guys for actually being here. This conversation was very essential, and it's something that we don't talk about enough. There's so many layers that we weren't able to get into, like the bullying, and, and I'm sure bullying exists even as an adult. Um, it's not just something that goes away. It probably is different looking, but I think that disability in general is something that we all have, I feel, a responsibility, a human rights responsibility to actually, you know, be more sensitive and be more aware and just ask, ask if anything instead of assuming or um, at the very worst dismissing or ignoring um, because that's that's something I noticed that's happening all the time and just from my perspective. And I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to 
really get into this conversation and you know I hope everyone took a little nugget home with them so thank you again for being here do we get to add anything really quick I just want to say we talk about disability but I, I really do think of it as being different abilities differently abled mm -hmm. everybody has a way that they can contribute to the community even mm -hmm. Jason Mm -hmm. He taught people how to be kind yeah. and caring. We all have something to give. Yeah. So differently abled, not just disabled. Dis yeah. So. I agree. Lifetime and uh, learning and experiences. Uh, hard times make people stronger, and uh, in the way I, in the way I look at it, you know, also. It's kind of like a wheelbarrow. It's not going to go any place unless you push it. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching this episode of Voices. I am really excited that we were able to make it to this point. Um, I really want to encourage all of you to continue to watch all the episodes, subscribe to our YouTube page. We are also partnered up now with Deja Blue Coffee House. So if you head to Deja Blue in town, we're actually going to have a special menu and anything you purchase off of that menu, the proceeds will go directly to our show. So we really encourage you to go out there and support us. We are also going to be having a binge watching rap party at the end of this season on December 13th and it will also be held at Deja Vu so definitely come out and, and support us and businesses and all um, anyone in the community who want to be also be a sponsor or help us raise funds for the show to continue uh, we really would appreciate that so please give us a call at 320-762-4466 or email us at voicestalkshow at gmail.com. Down in the bar.